So, um, and to tell a little about the documentary and how this came to be, it was about three years ago, um, right here, uh, we had our very first Fight on Book Club, um, and the very first book of the very first Fight on Book Club was the uh, Doorway to Freedom, the David Hoffman book, and I led that discussion. And I got a call from this person in Omaha who introduced himself as a, a documentary film producer. And he said, oh, this story was given to me by the Institute for Holocaust Education to do a documentary on. And you must know a lot about Kaufman. I'm like, well, I don't know a lot about him. I know a little. Um, he's like, so can we talk? And so um, that conversation, um, he came here at Grand Island. We talked and told me about the project he was doing. I said, it sounds like a really great project. And I'm really excited about it. But I have a lot on my plate right now because I'm in the midst of this project to place 12 new historical markers. And the Historical Society has a lot going on. So we will give you our support and um, go forth. Well, that support became support. Um, but I would not trade it for anything. This has been an incredible experience. Um, I've learned a lot about filmmaking. And I've learned a lot about our community. And, and again, one of the things David Kaufman, he believed that every person could make a difference, and he tried to inspire others to do what they could. And has this community stepped up? It has been incredible, the outpouring of support we've got. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And it's a little bit about David Kaufman, businessman, community leader, philanthropist, and quiet hero. All right, so um, just a little bit of a backstory here to start at the beginning. So in 1870 to 1880, there's two parallel stories that are going on here that are going to intersect. But I want to kind of give you a little bit of background. So 1873, the Walbach brothers um, opened their first store here in Grand Island. At the same time, about 1875, uh, David Kaufman was born in um, Badmusterfeld, Germany. And this is actually David and his mother up here, was the acute kid. Um, in 1880, Coffins are, uh, Walbach is doing really good here in Grand Island. And so in 1880, they build their first, their new brick store at the corner of 3rd and Pine Streets. And that store is still there today. I mean, the building is still there today. It's, it's all stuccoed over. Um, it's the, um, the, um, Kikos, yes, why not forget that name? I love Kikos. They have the best food if you haven't been there. Okay, so fast forward a few years. If you think they were not mobile, they were mobile. They moved around all the time. So he was on a buying trip in New York, and he goes into the, the Abraham and Strauss department store, and he sees this really nice window display. And he approaches this young man who he thinks made the window display, but it's actually this case of mistaken identity. David didn't do that one. <laughs> um, but he and Walbeck started talking, and Walbeck offered him a job and an opportunity to come to Grand Island, this brand new community we have, full of all these German immigrants. They speak your language, and we have all these opportunities. And so he encouraged him to come here to Grand Island. And so he did arrive on March 10th of 1904. David did not like <laughs> He got there. Okay, so remember, this man, um, he had lived in Berlin, and he had lived in New York, and he steps off the train in Grand Island, and he's like, what the hell did he sell me? <laughs> I got sold. Um, there was no, there was very little pavement. There were these dust storms that would blow up the dirt on the streets. Um, there was no building. I mean, there were a lot of buildings that were still wood buildings. There were not a lot of brick buildings, and there was no building over two stories high. So he writes to his brother, and he's like, "Find me a job, any job. I don't care. Get me the hell out of here." <laughs> 
Um, and so as he's waiting for his brother, so this is April of 1904. Well, six months later, his brother writes back and said, okay, I got you a job. Come on home. And David's like, no, you know what? I, I think I like it here. I think I'm good. Uh, don't worry about it. So he decides to stay in Grand Island and actually files for his citizenship papers in October of 1906. And so you'll see intermixed in my presentation some old and new. Um, up at the top, of course, that is a, a picture of 3rd Street in downtown Grand Island about the time David came. So again, you can kind of see we still have some wood buildings, we have dirt streets, you know, it's, it's nothing like Berlin or New York, right? <laughs> Um, and this scene down here, this is actually Mike Bachman. Um, he portrayed David, one of um, one of our David Coffins in our documentary. Uh, so this is him in the scene of writing back to his brother, saying, so "Get the hell out of this place." <laughs> okay, so 1906 to 1910. So this is where David's story really takes off. So just two years later, after he decides that he is going to stay here in Grand Island, so he's working for Wallback at the Wallback department store, but then he decides, he and two of his uh, colleagues in the Wallback store, um, Lawrence Wiener, Wernert, Wernert and Walter O'Connor, um, they decide that they want to go out on their own and they want to start their own store. And they're going to do a five and dime store based on the Woolworths model. And actually, they did invite Wallback to be a part of it. Um, and he's like, no, I've got a lot going on. You guys, you have my blessing. Go forth and, and do it. And your store is not really competing with my store. Wallback's was more high-end stuff. It wasn't the five and dime stuff they were talking about doing. Um, so they go ahead and start their store. Um, David also, during this period of time, like I said, he um, had decided in 1906 to become a U.S. citizen, and is that feedback? No, no. Okay, maybe it's just me. Um, so he decides to become a U.S. citizen, and in 1910, his citizenship is actually um, finalized. And so I want to read this to you. This is actually one of the articles. These are actual articles from the Independent. This is the one about the store being started, and this is the one about David's um, citizenship. And so in this article, um, it's titled No Hope. This is the article about him getting his citizenship. It's titled No Hope. Uh, District Court Judge James N. Paul, who's from St. Paul, did you know that St. Paul is actually named after the Paul family? There was no saint, it was just named after the Paul family. <laughs> um, he teased that a Kaufman, during his immigration interview, because the, he had to go through this interview with the judge before his immigration status was finalized. So when the judge was asking him about his marital state, uh, Kaufman said he was not married. And the judge said, any prospects? <laughs> <laughs> the question so flustered David um, and that the judge and the community enjoyed retelling the story over and over. Um, David did not marry right away. And, and the judge, he actually said, um, what was it? Married? No, sir. It was said without any enthusiasm, any hope. Um, so the young ladies apparently were going to be disappointed. There was no hope in the immediate future for David to marry. Um, he actually would not marry. He remained a bachelor for about 14 years after this until he married uh, one of the employees of the coffin store. Um, it was a, um, one of his uh, female employees. She was widowed, she was recently widowed in uh, 1920. Her name was Celia Colby Campbell. Campbell was her married name. Um, she worked in the millinery department at Wallback, or at the Kaufman store, and um, he married her in May of 1924. And there's a whole bunch of stuff I found out about Celia too, but we're not going to get into that today. Maybe there'll be another It Happened Here article for the Independent. <laughs> uh, so Kaufman's Five and Dime store opened its doors at 216 West 3rd Street in Grand Island. So not where it is today, it was down the street. Um, and it was one of those frame buildings. 
was wood. It was wood. It wasn't uh, was a brick. Um, Saturday, July 28th, 1906, it was 1,800 square feet, that first building. Um, again, it was based on the Woolworths model, and it was the third such store opened in Grand Island like it. Uh, in Nebraska, and the first one in Grand Island like it. So these three clerks who had been at the Wolfpack store, they were the first employees and first clerks in that new uh, business. Okay. So then, 1908 to 1923, David starts building his empire, his business empire, and he's building it really quickly. Uh, just two short years after he arrives in Red Island, of course, they open the store. Two years later, he's expanding already to Carney. Um, they're opening, um, he and his partners are opening a store in 1908. 1909, the business is increasing, so they expand their store in Grand Island um, to an adjacent space at 218. See, there is echo, it's not just me. Um, to an adjacent space, and um, they use a second story addition. Um, in 1914 to further expand their stock room and retail spaces. Um, so, so that was the enlarged. Again, they traveled a lot. So there were all of these um, things we found in the newspaper about he was going on business trips to Chicago, New York, Kansas City, Denver, Los <coughs> Angeles, all over the place. So he was really hands-on in the buying part of it. They opened their third store in North Platte in 1911. So then, so he's got three stores now, Grand Island, Kearney, North Platte. So then he starts diversifying his portfolio. He becomes a stockholder and treasurer in the Grand Island Jitney Company in 1915. And I have to tell you this, because this is a fun. Um, so, the Jitney Company was a busing company. It was Grand Island's first. I mean, we had the, we had the street drawn trolleys, but this was actually motorized busing. Mm -hmm. um, there were, and this was all in the paper, the description of it. The buses themselves were seven person buses. They were orangish yellow. They both, they had rear and side entrances and cushioned seats. <laughs> um, yes, it's height of comfort. They had set routes from Jitney Corner, it's actually called Jitney Corner, at 3rd and Pine Streets, which is actually across the street from the Wallback store. Um, also, I read, talking about the Jitney Company, there was a lot of um, angst over that because there was taxi services in Grand Island. And so they promised that the Jitney would not cross taxi lines. They would, you know, they would stay on their set routes. <laughs> So within 10 years of business, starting business in, in here in Grand Island, he starts to become known statewide. I mean, he was already a leader locally. Um, it, he becomes a statewide leader. He was named the president of the Nebraska Variety Merchants Association. And he was also named um, president of the Grand Island Commercial Club, which we now know as the Chamber of Commerce. Um, yeah, it was reorganized in 1917. He was he was reading the president. Okay, so we all know we have Eeks in Grand Island, right? Before we had Eeks, the businessmen needed some place to get office supplies, and so David and some associates came up with an idea to start their own office supply store. So the office supply store offered printing services. They offered um, office equipment and supplies for banks and offices. So they organized that office supply house in October of 1919. Also in October of 1919, they opened a second store in Kearney. This wasn't replacing the first store. They actually had two stores in Kearney. Um, they had a little different wear at each store. The um, business environment there was a little bit different than the Grand Island. They, they saw a need, so they decided to open a second store in Kearney to build that need. And then, 
This is where I say he, his hands were in everything. He was even involved in the construction of the Yancey Hotel. So construction was stalling on the Yancey, um, and this a group of stockholders, because Grinnell businessmen had come together to be stockholders for the Yancey, um, got together with the builder, and um, they decided to appoint five businessmen, including David Kaufman, to take charge and get the project moving. Um, other committee members were S.N. Walbeck, Henry Bartonback, John Allen, and Willard Prince. Um, so they were all businessmen in downtown Grand Island, and they all had an invested interest in getting this hotel built. Uh, of course, the war, uh, war derailed it just for a little bit more, but they did get it built, and it is still there today, that building is. And Kaufman actually had a lot of um, dinners that he hosted there and parties for his employees. Uh, so he heavily utilized the ENC when it was built. So again, he's he's here on another buying trip, but this time he's coming back from Europe, um, and he decided to stop in New York to buy his fall and winter goods for his Grand Allen and Carney stores in 1921, according to uh, the Carney Daily News. Mm -hmm. And then, 1923. So the Grand Island store, uh, that, that frame wood building, uh, was no longer, even though they had expanded, it was still not big enough. So in 1923, David Kaufman, in August of 1923, he announced that they were going to begin excavation soon um, on 308, 310, and 312. So they were taking three buildings on West 3rd Street. This building was going to be, this is the words from the paper, entirely fireproof two-story brick building with a full basement underneath for the stock room. This new building expanded Coffin Store's retail space from the original at 1800 to 17,424 square feet. This is less than 20 years after he started his business. Uh, as customers entered the new coffin, 5, 10, and 25 cent store at that time, <laughs> through what is the three doors, of course, you know, the three doors are all still there, facing 3rd Street on May 3rd, 1924. Remember, they started with three clerks? Well, this new space, they had 30 clerks. Oh, wow. And um, one of his employees um, who actually started at the, at this, the store on 200 block, um, was a young man. His name was Bill Redlinger. Um, he came in as a young boy, and he asked um, for a job. And so David gave him a room, told him to get to work. Uh, so he started there at the age of 14. He would work there for 50 more years. Oh. And before he started, David told him, this is my philosophy. You need to know this if you want to work here. Before you start, I want to tell you something. If you follow this advice throughout your career in this store, you will come out all right on the other end. Are you ready? There's only one way, and that's the right way. Remember that. It's not there's only one way. It's my way. It's the right way. And that's the way he operated. This is before the, the new store is finished. Um, again, just 20 years after he came into the community, David is recognized as one of the who's who in Hall County and the Independent. This is the actual article. Um, and this is a um, photograph up here of the Leader Prince Board of Directors um, when they were getting ready to build the new Leader Prince building. And this was the Kaufman store down here before the grand, the new grand theater was built. Um, okay, so David is who's who in Hall County 20 years after he's here. Um, and it gave like all of this, you know, this um, resume for him of all the things he had done. Um, you know, he spent eight months in New York, he came to Hall County, he started at Wallbacks, um, he has interest in stores in Kearney. He's president of the Agricultural Society. 
Board of Governors on the Chamber of Commerce. He's the director of Labor Parents. He'd also been a president of Labor Parents. We'll talk about that too. The other thing I want to point out, and you can't really read it, it's, it's kind of small, so I'm going to read it for you because I love this. I think it's hilarious. Um, so it, in addition to all of this glowing praise for his business accomplishments and the things that he was doing in the community, he also, um, when he was named Who's Who, got some ribbing uh, for his golf game. It says, at golf, he makes nine holes in something like a hundred. <laughs> um, in his bowling game, it says, guardrails are required to protect the spectators. <laughs> because, you know, there was a bowling alley in the, in the later grants. And in cards, it said, in making a play in scat, with or without matadors, who's all there. And I don't know anything about scat, but what I think it under means is, he doesn't care if he's a good hit or a bad hand, he's going to go for it. <laughs> he must have had a really good bluff. All right, so 1934. Now, this is 30 years after he's in the community. Um, he is actually named Man of the Year. And this is where we have this quote um, that keeps getting attributed to David Kaufman, where he says, most of us have more good thoughts than we have bad ones. And all we have to do is follow the good thoughts. The handicap is often that the good thoughts are not followed by required action. So he, he said this during the speech that he gave when he accepted the Man of the Year in 1934. Uh, and so that's where we credit to a lot. But actually, this isn't the first time he ever said those words. I think he was a man that once he had an idea, he kept expressing that idea. Um, I actually found something similar that he had used in other speeches. In fact, one of them was from the Nebraska Merchants Association when he was giving a speech there about how to treat your employees. Um, so that was his philosophy, and that's how he lived his life. Um, and the other thing, interesting thing too, during the speech that he gave in 1934 when he was accepting the Man of the Year, that was the first time, 30 years after he's been here, that he confessed to people he hated it in Great Island when he started. <laughs> <laughs> and no one had known that he had written home, maybe Wallback knew, because maybe he was homesick and he talked to Wallback, but no one knew that David was unhappy in Grand Island and wanted to leave mm -hmm. um, until 1934, when he was given the speech and he confessed to all that um, he really was enthusiastic about the community to begin with, but it was the people here who more, uh, won him over, and that's why he decided to stay. And, and so then, then he goes into the, the good thoughts and the required action, and that Grand Island and his community really did that. And he, ended, again, encouraged others to do the same. All right, so the next, expanding the business empire and leaving mm -hmm. his legacy. So following the stock market crash in 1929, um, David actually marked down everything in his store. He told his managers, mark everything down to wholesale prices. People need stuff. We have stuff. We need to sell it, and we need to help them out. We're probably going to take a loss. Probably take a loss for a year, maybe more. It doesn't matter. We're going to keep our doors open, and we're going to serve the community. Also, during this time, um, he and his first wife, Celia, become advisors and assistants to the Red Cross Self-Help Society, which allows people to work for store credit. Um, he also, one of the things he did during this period of time, and maybe even before and maybe even after, was he would leave items, food and clothing, at the end of the loading dock at the end of the day. So if someone needed something, they could come take what they needed. So in 1931, depression's still going on. I mean, the stock market just crashed two years ago. The depression's still going on. Um, but they chartered a new bank. Banks were failing all over the place. They chartered a new bank. It was called the Commercial National Bank in Grand Island. And David Kaufman was uh, selected to be the first president of the newly chartered bank. All 
All right, 1931. Depression still going on. David decides to renovate the Grand Theater that was located at 316 West 3rd Street, so right next door to the Kaufman's um, department store. He had uh, acquired that building. It had been the uh, Lydia, Lydia, Lydia before. Okay, 1934. Depression's still going on. And Kaufman decides he's going to air condition his entire store. <laughs> that 18,000 square foot store, he's going to put air conditioning in it. And it was promoted as the single largest department store installation in the Midwest in June of 1934 when it was installed. Um, the cooling system was installed by the Western Air Condition Company. Um, so people had a place to come in and cool off. All right, again, still diversifying his portfolio. He becomes um, president and director of the Pathfinder Life Insurance Association in 1935. Okay, they just five years ago did renovation on the Grand Theater, but it's not good enough for David. <laughs> they're going to tear it down and they're going to build a new building. So um, they announced in uh, September of 1936 that they were going to do this. Um, so 19, and he also is deciding to do some construction on the Kaufman store as well. So in 1937, he added a lunch counter and soda fountain um, according to the newspaper. And um, I should say that Grand Theater, when it opened, um, it had stadium seating with state of the art systems and the art deco design that we know today. <coughs> oh, and before I get here, so that remodel at Kaufman's, it wasn't just adding a, a lunch counter and a soda fountain. Um, the store, David again decided there's only one way and that's the right way. So that store is 31 years old at this point. Well, no, it's not 31 years old. His business is 31 years old. That store is only 20, no, 12, 15 years old. It's not very old. Um, anyway, so he decided in this remodel, they reduced, there were six north-south aisles on the main floor. Um, he reduced it down to three and increase the three um, west, uh, east-west aisles to eight. He added the lunch counter, the soda fountain, and the northwest uh, part of the building, which had previously been the music department. And I know everyone says the music department was upstairs with Lottie. I've heard that. Um, but it used to be downstairs. Um, and he built a kitchen in that area. It was, to be, um, it was previously a, a loading platform. And this new remodel was going to include entirely new and modern fixtures. He stated the store, and this is again, this is David. This is, we don't close. He's reported that this store will not be closed during construction and would operate under a business as usual slogan. So they never shut down during construction. All right, so 1955. It was announced in, um, actually, it was announced um, in 19, oh, December of 1955 that January of 1956, David would be retiring from the Kaufman store after half a century in business. So David and Madeline, who was his second wife, um, she had been married to Harry Schiller, who ran the theater for David. Um, David lost his first wife, Celia, about the same time Madeline lost Harry. So they, um, these two, um, they, the couples had been friends, and so they, they became a, part, a couple themselves, and he married Madeline. Um, so he and Madeline were going to maintain stock in Kaufman's Inc., along with longtime employees of the store, Bill Rellinger, who was that 14-year-old who started there and became a manager, 
and Howard Mangelson, or Harold Mangelson. Um, Hested Stores was purchasing the, the, um, the store, or purchasing an interest in the new corporation, and they would continue to operate that store as Kaufman and Hested's, or they, or they already had a Hested store in town. So they maintained that store with the Kaufman name um, and continued to operate it because Hestead's had been in Grand Island since 1930. Um, that store, the Kaufman store, kept the name Kaufman until 1970. David passed away in 1969, so after his death, the store was then renamed to Newberry's. <coughs> David also, in 1958, um, after 27 years as the president of the Commercial National Bank, he decided to step down and become chairman of the board. And that vacancy opened up um, a space for some other people, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. David Kaufman passed away on August 3rd of 1969 at the age of 93. <coughs> Madeline um, would survive him until December of 1983. She actually went on to marry again a third time. Um, and after her death, the there was an endowment established to provide a fund for the Kaufman Cummings Trust um, to be administered by the Kaufman Cummings Foundation, which is still in operation today, supporting the community through scholarships and awards to nonprofits, including us. So we got some money from the Kaufman Foundation uh, for the film. So still, so we're we're over over 50 years after David about 55 years after David passed away and he's still giving to the community today and supporting the community today. All right, these are just some pictures, uh, again, talking about expanding that business empire uh, to kind of show you. So here we have the old grand, or the little grand, that they tore down and built Nebraska's finest movie theater, again, during the Depression. Uh, up here is a picture of 3rd Street, looking down 3rd Street. Notice what we don't have anymore. We, we don't have dirt streets and we don't have wood buildings. We still don't have any buildings that were two stories tall though. Um, here's the lunch counter that they opened at the Kaufman's store. Um, Kaufman's, uh, the front of it. Um, this is uh, an interior shot of the Kaufman's, if anyone remembers going in there. And then um, this is a, a note uh, an advertisement in the, uh, the newspaper for the Commercial National Bank. So David Coffin was president, Ed Walt was um, vice president. When David um, retired as president, went to the board, Ed um, stepped up into president, and they brought in a, a young banker from out of town to come in and step up as vice president. And I'll talk about that in just a second, but. What that did is they did a domino effect, and when Ed stepped up to the board himself, that vice president they brought in stepped up to be the president. He was the third president of Commercial National Bank. And so that leads me to this, talking about employee welfare. Kaufman really treated his people well. Um, so Young Bill reported he remembered that when he was made a manager of the Kaufman store, his annual bonus at the time was 5% of the net profits. Five years later, his bonus was 10% of the profits. Ten years later, he was getting 15% of the profits. And um, in 1934, so this is, you know, he's been with the store about, uh, 25 years at this point. Uh, he re remembered being surprised by Kaufman with an elaborate dinner dance at the Gold Room of the Hotel Yancey in honor of that anniversary. 
Um, young Bill had gone from sweeping the floors to the general manager and a junior partner of the Kaufman store. David and Celia presented him with a handsome wristwatch, and the store employees gifted him with a lovely leather traveling set. Apparently, he and his wife enjoyed traveling um, the world after that. And he still worked at Kaufman's. He, he didn't leave Kaufman's. Um, and then in 1935, in addition to being a junior partner in um, the Kaufman store, he, Bill himself, expanded and opened his own five and ten cent store in Lexington and had his brother, who formerly worked for Kaufman's, manage that store in Lexington for him. Another employee that had worked for David, oops, sorry, um, was Izzy Kahn. Um, he was one of the people that David brought over from Germany, and Izzy worked at the, the Kaufman store for a while, and he went out and started his own business and used a car lot. David, I, and I think he kind of, I think he took a lot of lessons from Wallback. You know, Wallback told these three young clerks, you have my blessing, go start your business, and set them on their own path. I think David did that for a, a lot for his own employees. Um, another employee of David's, remember I said that he stepped to be the board chair of the bank, and that kind of created this, this move and this vacuum. The man that they brought in to be vice president of the Commercial National Bank, who then later served as president when Ed stepped up to the board, his name was Bill Marshall, Jr. Oh, wow. um, he came to Grand Island in 1959 to work as a vice president of the bank um, when David stepped back. He became the third president of Commercial National Bank from 1965 to 1971. Um, and then he went on to start his own bank, which of course is Five Points Bank, in 1971. Another former employee of Kaufman's, who was also a junior partner, um, he went on and started his own variety business, um, and it is still in operation today. It's Mangelson's. Howard Mag Harold Mangelson started Mangelson's in Omaha um, in uh, 1961, and his son says that they are still using business practices today at the Mangelson store that his father learned from taking care of his employees. He gave them all bonuses. Um, he had a sick benefit association. So if someone was sick, they, they had a, a fund that everyone had a portion of their check put into, so they had sick leave available to them. He gave them um, anniversary watches. I even found an article, one of my grandmother's sisters was a long time Hopkins employee. I found an article about a wristwatch that she had gotten for an anniversary. Um, they always had their their par company parties with, and, or celebratory dinners at the Yancey Hotel. And again, like I said, he supported all of his employees who wanted to go out and start a business to do so. And this was a quote from David himself. He said, the Kaufman store prides itself on the high average of years of employment of those who make up the staff, as well as the sales personnel. I give a good share of credit for the constant growth of the establishment to the steadiness and loyalty of the employees. Again, he wasn't taking ownership of all the things he had done. He was crediting his employees for the success of the business. <coughs> so his community involvement is as impressive as his business accomplishments. In uh, 1914 to 1915, he was president of the Leader Grants. He'd only been here 10 years, and he was already president of the Leader Grants. Uh, 1917, and then again in 1941 to 1945, he was a Red Cross campaign chair. Um, in 19, 19 to 1924, he was a Hall County Jewish Children's Relief Fund chairman. And this role here is the only time I have ever come across anything with David Kaufman having a crossword to say about anyone. So everyone, so after World War I, there were a lot of people in Europe who were suffering. And there was a, a Jewish relief fund for Jewish children. And the state had a quota, and they had given every county a quota, and every county had a chairperson, and David was one of the chairpersons for Hall County. And apparently there was someone who made a disparaging mark about giving money to these starving children, these starving Jewish ch children. And David really laid into, into a response in the newspaper. He laid into it. 
And that's the only time I've ever heard David say anything cross about anyone. Um, in 1924, he was named campaign chair for the Grand Island College campaign. In 1927, he became a lifetime member of the Hall County Historical Society, and he served as our um, treasurer on the board. He was a long-time treasurer. So from 1928 to 1957, he was a board member and treasurer for the Historical Society. 1927, he was Salvation Army, campaign chairman. Um, and this is something really kind of interesting, kind of a side note, going back to his faith. Mm -hmm. I came across this in 1943. He and Izzy Khan organized and conducted services at the Salvation Army on Friday evenings for Jewish soldiers who were stationed in Grand <coughs> Island and in Kearney. Uh, so they would have a place to worship. So he organized those services for them. And um, 1948, he was the campaign chair for the St. Francis Hospital School of Nursing and the Nurses' Home. It was a half a million dollar project and they broke ground on uh, June of 1949. So, started 48, broke ground 49. He got stuff done. Okay, and then 1956, he was approached by Sister Philomena from St. Francis. Um, and David is Jewish. But he was approached by Sister Philomena. Uh, she wanted to establish a lay ward for the hospital. And she tapped him to do that. And I mean, no offense to anyone here because I am Catholic. So I, I mean, no offense to anyone who is Catholic. When a nun asks you to do something, you do it. <laughs> so it didn't matter that he was Jewish and, and St. Francis was a Catholic hospital. David just did it because he was asked by Sister Philomena. So he brought together a group of 21 of businessmen to create the St. Francis Hospital Lay Ward. Um, their mission was to become acquainted with the facilities at the hospital and problems that need to be resolved on a daily basis, to work closely with administration and staff, and to serve as a public relations and information um, coordinator to between the hospital and the public. Um, so he was recognized for his role in bringing the group together. And I believe, if someone correct me if I'm wrong, the lay board is still in operation at CHI now today. Yep. So there you go. It was founded because of David Kaufman. Um, he was also a member of the Plottage and the Elks Club. Um, and being a part of the Historical Society, of course, he was involved in getting Stolly State Park established. Um, and then also he was involved in the establishment of Stern Museum because that was our original mission was to get a museum um, established. And so when Stern Museum was established, I actually have a letter from the director of the museum at the time thanking David for his contribution of artifacts and money for the establishment of the museum. Um, he also served as the president of the Hall County Fair Association from 1923 to 1931. Again, he was a guy from, from big cities, and he's the president of the fair board, and he was a very enthusiastic president of the fair board. And he kept it going for as long as he could, because the fair was um, kind of under some financial issues, um, but he kept them going. Um, and then in 1931, he stepped down as president, and not long after that is when the Hall County uh, Fair lost their land and all of their buildings, and we would not have a permanent home again until Honor Park was built. Um, and if anyone didn't know this, the fair at the time was actually uh, west of here. It was like west of the overpass, kind of like where the armory is, and that's the area is where the fairgrounds used to be. Um, and then also, because again, he had his fingers in everything, and um, I'm happy to say the Kaufman Cummings Foundation has donated some money to the Women's Club to, um, uh, for their restoration. But he was also involved in the purchasing of the building of the Women's Club. If you go in there, they have a list of all of the donors who gave money to the Women's Club to buy the Hargis House Mansion. And there is David Kaufman. So all this stuff is going on here in, in the community. Oh, and there's one real quick story I want to tell you about a little bit. I think it's funny to kind of speak to him and his character. Because again, when he saw something that needed to be done, he was going to do it. Um, 
he noticed there were a lot of dandelions in people's yards. <laughs> and that perturbed him. So he decided he could do something about it. And he challenged the children of Grand Island to go out and pick the dandelions and then bring the dandelions to him. And for every pound of dandelions they brought him, he would give them an orange. He underestimated the children of Grand Island. <laughs> because they didn't just pick dandelions from people's lawns. No, they went out in the prairie and the and all those places. They brought him a thousand pounds of dandelions. <laughs> he didn't have enough oranges. <laughs> So he told them that he would make sure, actually not thousands, sorry, it's probably 100 pounds on it, but still 100 pounds of dandelions is a lot of dandelions. Anyway, he did have enough oranges, but he told them the next time uh, he got a shipment in, he would make sure that everyone got their oranges. And he never again challenged the children. <laughs> <laughs> um, something else, a kind of an interesting story about David, um, talking about the store that closed during construction. And his philosophy was, we don't close. We are here to serve the customers, and we are here to serve the customers. Um, one of the things in working on this documentary, one of the uh, family members had contacted me and said, oh, I found some photographs, and I want to send these to you um, for the film. And she sent them, and it was such an amazing gift. There was this box, and it was full. And actually, the box came from David's house, and it was full of photographs, and it was full of postcards, and it was full of um, newspaper articles he cut out, he'd actually drawn two things or written on them. And there also was an envelope in there, it was a handwritten, um, it was an envelope that had been written in handwriting, and it said to be opened immediately upon my death. Okay. And of course it was open, and inside were all of his funeral directions and his handwritten obituary. But included in his funeral directions, it directed that the Kaufman department store would be closed for two hours on the day of the service. <laughs> And only two hours. <laughs> so even in that, he was directing that we don't close. <laughs> all right. So while all this is going on, he's doing all these things in, these commu in the community. Back in his homeland, this is happening. single one of these headlines and articles is from the Grand Island Independent. David was reading this in his newspaper right here in Grand Island. This is where his family is from. This is where his friends are from. This is happening to his people. knew what was going on in, in Germany, you know, uh, uh, all of a sudden you wouldn't hear from relatives anymore. For him it was a big risk. He knew something was wrong and he knew he had to do something. He had the ability to make a difference, to help people, to be an upstander. David took a risk, a calculated risk, 
In the heartland of America, a small town hides the remarkable story of an unlikely hero. Driven to escape poverty, an oppressive government, and religious persecution, German-born Jew David Kaufman flees to the land of opportunity. While building his business empire in Grand Island, Nebraska, chaos erupts in his homeland under the Nazi regime. Mr. Kaufman stepped in and he knew what was going on. There were rumors about what was about to happen. They use violence and they do not hesitate to kill. Desperate to save family and friends back home, Kaufman uses his business resources and political savvy to rescue an entire community of refugees from the German death camps. David Kaufman did. Uh, bringing the Jews over here, uh, sponsoring them, and saved the lives of a, a lot of German people. He was financially responsible for all of those people he brought over. Mr. Kaufman saved hundreds of lives. That's what makes the Kaufman story so fascinating, is the number, the sheer number of people that he helped get here. I mean, I think people assume that one person in a small town in the middle of nowhere, what could they possibly do? He's risking everything he has for a family he doesn't really know. Grand Island residents know Kaufman as a businessman and philanthropist, but few have heard of his selfless actions that saved countless lives. Oscar Schindler had a list, and David Kaufman had a part. Think of how many people, because of the work he did, or was involved in, how many families are alive today as a result of that. When We are going to have a screening of um, A Life Well Lived, the account of David Kaufman, and it's really a get into more of this, this important humanitarian work that he did that no one here knew that he was doing um, during his lifetime. No one knew what was going on. The people, the families knew, um, but no one knew what he was doing. So it is a fascinating story. I'm thrilled that we have had a small part in getting this story put together. And our hopes, mm -hmm. it, um, so we'll have you know a screening here. Um, I've been approached um, about possibly doing a screening in Kearney and in Omaha. And that will probably be the end of the public screenings because what we're trying to do is get it into the PBS distribution network. Mm -hmm. So we can't have too many people see it. Um, <laughs> And the other part of trying to get into the PBS distribution network is we can't really be making money on it. So if you do come to the Grand Theater tomorrow, we are not charging admission, but we are suggesting a donation of at least the chart, the price of admission, and that money will help us to finish the production costs, the promotion costs, the distribution costs, and then also getting into the PBS distribution network, one of our goals is to get this into curriculum. Um, Nebraska schools are required to have Holocaust education, and across the country there is um, requirements for Holocaust education as too. The PBS system will <coughs> give us a professional group of curriculum writers who would write that curriculum and then make it available for public schools, and that's really what we're wanting to do. So um, I'm super excited. And all those emotions I can't explain. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, I will try to answer them, but I know our time is up. And if, if you need to leave, I certainly understand too. And like I said, more. The way they are, I know I don't know my history the way I should, but I don't understand the almost world hatred for Jesus. So, talking about the anti Semitism, why? why? Um, so, actually, tomorrow, um, if you come see the film, Dr. Torsten Homberger from UNK, and you saw him there in the short clip, he talks a little bit about what was going on in Germany at the time. Um, so, Germany had kind of undergone a um, financial crisis, 
they had the failed First World War. Um, there were some economic issues. And then Hitler came to power as being this charismatic leader who was, I know you're suffering, I know you're all suffering, and it's not your fault. And he had to have someone to point to. So he said, you know, the Jewish the Jewish people in, in Germany were a lot of them were bankers and they were in education and they were in positions of power. Um, you know, they were business owners and so they became the scapegoat. It's not your fault that you're suffering, it's someone else. And I mean, not to get too deep in it, but the entire history of the world, uh, there's always been that idea of other. If it's not me, it's someone else who is the other that I can blame. And unfortunately, and for the Jewish people in Germany, they were the ones that were blamed for the, the troubles that we were having. Where are David and his wives buried? So David and his first wife, Celia, are buried here in Grand Island at the Grand Island City Cemetery next to her son, Rex, um, who passed away um, when David and Celia were married. He died at the age of 40. And then Rex's wife, Anna, um, they're both buried next to David and Celia. And then Madeline is buried in Central City next to Harry, who was her first husband. Did he have any children? He did not have children, no. Um, and then all the families that he rescued, not everyone was he related to, but they all called him Uncle David, and he was very involved in their lives. And so one of the people that's going to be coming this weekend, I'm super excited, uh, she wanted to be here now, but they actually left um, Denver early, really early this morning, and they weren't able to make it here just in time. Um, but she actually was, one of the children that were born here, and she's featured in the film, and she's coming to watch the film. Um, the first person that you saw on that clip, actually, his name is Marcel Khan. He's the only person who's still living that they could actually brought over. He was six years old, um, he, um, and his brother was four when they came with their family. His brother has passed away, but um, his niece was another one that's featured in the film as well. Yeah, I was wondering, was there ever a synagogue to serve Jewish population here in Grand Island? Island? There was a really big Jewish community, or a significant Jewish community, but there was no synagogue. So they held services um, in each other's homes, and then also David would go to Omaha to go to Temple as well, and Izzy drove him to Temple a lot later in life, um, and actually Rabbi Kritsky, who was from the Temple in um, Omaha that David belonged to, is the one who actually did his services for him. I found at one point that they had met for some period of time in the labor temple, which is uh, one of our mm -hmm. places in the church. Yeah, Sue said at one point they, they met in the labor temple. They, they did have services, but they did not have an official temple here. Um, like I said, during World War II, they did, uh, even in the Salvation Army, they held services. Uh, No, no, he did not. Um, but like I said, we had a really big community. And actually, if you're interested, and before you leave, um, I brought in some um, some programs and events that the historical studies could be having the next year. Uh, in April of next year, Scott Lipke, who was, you saw him in the film, he's the director for the Institute for Holocaust Education in Omaha. He's going to come here in April and do a program for us for our Voices program about some of the Jewish um, business owners in central Nebraska. Um, so they were all, they all knew each other, they were counterparts, but they weren't, he wasn't one of them that they brought over. And actually, um, talking about um, Gus Catrusis, he was interviewed as well, and he was talking about um, the relationship between the Greeks and the Germans. And I believe the word that he used was Nene, all that Nene, that love that they had. Um, so there were there were smaller pockets of immigrant communities. I mean, of course, David was German, um, but he was also Jewish, and so there were smaller pockets too that would associate with one another. All right, we are past twelve o'clock, so I hope you all come to the movie tomorrow. Check it out. Um,